Here's what I want to do. Open up your Bibles, okay? Open up your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. I actually want to pick off, pick off, we'll pick things off the tree, uh, pick up where we left off is what I meant to say. I want to pick up where we left off two weeks ago. I preached a sermon two weeks ago uh, called Purpose in Your Pocket. Purpose in My Pocket. If you uh, didn't listen to it or you weren't here, you can uh, go online. Uh, and listen to that. I want to kind of, in some ways, give a, a little part two to that, Purpose in Your Pocket Part Two. I'm calling this sermon's title a, a little bit uh, of a different thing, but uh, I want to go back to, to that Ephesians chapter one verse. That's what, what I want to use as our jump off point. And uh, if, if you're new with us, uh, we are in a collection of talks in a sermon series that we've entitled Purpose. Somebody say Purpose. And uh, one of the things that we're we're really wanting to do, here's what we believe. We believe that every single human being on planet Earth, all 7.8 billion people on planet Earth have a purpose. Do you believe that? And you have a purpose. I have a purpose. We have a purpose. You and I, we have a God-given purpose. Purpose. I don't know if you've ever considered that, um, but I want us to consider that because that's what we believe, that you and I, we have a purpose. And, and I don't know about you, but if that's true, if it's true that, that God has a purpose for every single person here in this room, I don't know about you, but, but I want to know that purpose. Anybody else here want to know that purpose? Like, I don't want to live my life on accident. I want to live my life on purpose. I want to know what that purpose is. Uh, one of my pastors uh, used to always say, he used to have this, this saying, this quote, where he says, uh, life, is, life is like a coin. Anybody carry coins anymore? Anybody know what coins are? Some of y'all are too young to know what coins are. Um, before plastic credit cards, and now you could do everything on your Apple iPhone, Apple Pay, uh, there used to be coins. But he, he used to say this, he said, life is like a coin. And here's the thing, you could spend it any way that you want but you could only spend it once. You like that? I don't know, that always kind of just resonated with me. Life is like a coin. You could spend it any way that you want, but you could only spend it once. And so my question to us, my question to myself, my question to you is how are you spending your coin? How are you spending this one gift, this one thing called life that God has given to you? And I don't know about you, but I want to make it count. I want to make it mean something. I, I, and that's my hope. That's my, my prayer for us as a church. And so that's really what this, this sermon series is about is uh, we want to help you. We want to help you discover, to identify, to unpack, uh, but most importantly, to begin to live in to your God-given purpose. Amen? So I want to continue uh, in that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, just a quick kind of recap. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about this idea that if you want to understand your God-given purpose, we first have to understand, we have to go back to the creator because it's in our creator that we discover our purpose. And so uh, you and I, every human being on planet Earth, we have a univ- what's called a universal purpose or a general purpose. And then two weeks ago, I talked about, we got a little bit more specific and we talked about the, the Christian purpose. And today I want to get even more specific. I actually want to talk about this idea, this concept, this notion of your specific purpose, your unique purpose, your personal purpose. And that's what I want to talk about. Anybody interested today in knowing their, their specific God-given purpose? Yes, five of you. Fantastic. So Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, he says this, and we read this two weeks ago, but I want to focus on the second half of the, the, the verse, the passage. It says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. So two weeks ago, we talked about this idea that uh, if we want to know our our Christian purpose, that's found actually in Christ. You don't actually have to go searching that far for it. If you are in Christ, if you have Jesus, then you actually already know and you possess in your very pocket your your Christian purpose. Uh, But then he goes on and he says, long before we first heard of Christ, Long before we were so, uh, quote, unquote, Christian, long before that, before we heard of Christ and got our hopes up, listen to this. He had his eye on us. He had his eye on us. He had designs. Somebody say designs. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and to everyone. So I want to talk about, again, your specific purpose and I'll title this message today, uh, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Know your role. 
know your role. Turn to your person next to you and make sure you don't touch them. Give them some space, but say, do you know your role? Do you know your role? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for uh, this morning. Thank you for this space. Uh, thank you that you allow us to gather in your name. And uh, we thank you that whether or not we know you or not, you know us. You know us by name. You created us. You put purpose in our hearts. And so, God, I pray now as we um, just spend some time in your word that you would open up our hearts, our minds, our, our eyes, our ears. Uh, Lord, I don't, maybe for some of us there is fear because of the unknown and all that's happening in our world and uh, even with the virus. And I just pray right now just a supernatural peace just to rest over this place right now. That we don't have to live in fear uh, because we know that perfect love casts out all fear. So God, I pray that we, right now as we just sit and receive, God, that we can sit and receive uh, and experience, God, just your goodness and your love and your mercy and your peace just washing over us, every single person right now. We thank you. We love you. praise you in Jesus' name. All God's people sit. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the things I started doing a, a couple weeks back, it's been about a month now, maybe a little bit over a month, is I started coaching my youngest sons. I got three kids. My youngest son, his name's Eli. He's six years old. And I started coaching his, his basketball team. We're, we put him in, him and my daughter in this little church league. And so I thought I would kind of do my Christian responsibility and be a good pastor and a good father and give back to my kid and to my community. And so I'm, I'm coaching uh, these, basically these little five, four, five, six-year-olds, like pre kindergarten. There's like one uh, gal on the team who's like a, a pre-K. I think that's what you call it. But it's mostly like kindergarten, first grade. And so I don't know, but you, I, I don't, I know a lot of you don't have kids uh, or if you can even remember this far back, but uh, when we, when I say that I'm coaching my six-year-old or some five-year-olds, it's not really coaching. All right. It, it's more like kind of herding cats. It's more like keeping my, these kids from like killing each other kind of thing. Right. So if you were to watch, uh, you know, some of these basketball games, uh, especially like early on in the season, it, it probably wouldn't look much like a basketball game at all. And uh, I remember vividly our, our very first game. Um, we have a couple kids. The skill levels on, on the team are, are vary from, you know, never played before to maybe playing a year or two. So overall, the skill level isn't that like great. Um, but nonetheless, there's just uh, a wide variety of kind of people's experiences in these kids. And so um, the very first game, I'll never forget it, um, where, you, you know, when you have to, anybody know what, how, how basketball works, where you got to like throw the ball in bounds and, and you got to have somebody bring it up to court. So just imagine this, right? So it's the first game. And the nice thing about it is because these kids have never played before, they allow the coaches like on the floor. And so we, I, as a coach, I literally get to just walk up and up and down the court with these kids. And so uh, we, the first time that we had to inbound the ball, I had one of the kids inbound the ball. And uh, I didn't even realize that I need to give this type of instruction, but I, I soon quickly realized that I did. Literally, there's five kids on a court at a time. One kid's thrown in the bounds and all of my four other kids are literally standing right in front of the kid inbounding the ball. And, uh, and what they're doing is they're standing in front of the kid inbounding the ball. And everybody's got their hands up like this saying, pass, 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 right? And so you can imagine just the terror on the one kid who's trying to throw the ball and bounce, right? Because all of a sudden he's got like four other kids that are literally right in front of his face. And they're all like, give me the ball. They all want the ball. And in that moment, I had this realization that as a coach, I needed to intervene, right? Because, because here, here's what we understand, if you know anything about sports, if you know anything about basketball, is that not everybody can bring the ball up the court. Not everybody's the point guard, right? And, and what I quickly realized is if I was going to help this team, these young five, six-year-olds learn how to play the game of basketball, what I would need to do is start with the very basic principle. And that very basic fundamental principle is that everybody has a different role. Not everybody could be the point guard. Not everybody could take the ball in court because if so, well then the game is gonna be pretty chaotic. And life for these young kids is gonna be pretty chaotic. Some of them are just gonna be standing around. Others, others of them are gonna be fighting and yelling at each other. See, that's oftentimes what happens when we don't understand a role. And so over time, as I'm try trying to help these kids understand how to play the game of basketball, well, one of the most important things that I can do is to help them understand their role. 
And it's when they identify their role in the specific role in the specific position that they're supposed to play when all of a sudden I can actually have someone bringing the ball up court, the other person down at the block, and the other person here on the wing. All of a sudden, the game starts to make sense. And the kids actually started to have a little bit more fun. They actually started to be a lot more effective when it came to this game called basketball. Now, I want to suggest, do you realize this? That, that you and I, we have a, a, a God-given role in this world. In fact, nobody else can fulfill or can complete the very specific God-given role and purpose that God has actually put on your life. Do you realize that you are unique? That you are special? That you are different? That there is no one else like you? Therefore, no one else can actually do the things that God put you on planet Earth to do. You and I, we have a God-given role. We have a specific purpose. In fact, that's what I, so, I love about Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul reminds us of this truth. Where, what does he say? He says this. He says, long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, what happens? He had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Did you, did you see that? So God has his eye on us, and he had a design for us from the very beginning. You know, we just talked about how we just launched our Common Good Lifestyle, and Jesse created these designs. And I don't know if you if, how many, any designers in the house, any artists in the house, Okay, you know, everyone's like, all the designers like have their ha hands like halfway up. Um, but you know this, right? If you, if, if, if you, even if you're not a designer, if you're not an artist, you understand that to design something well, it takes intentionality. So when Jesse designed these shirts, it took multiple months where he was thinking about what he wanted to do, how to communicate a certain message, that it was creating it as putting it down and then looking at it and, and tweaking it and making it a little bit better. See, so design just by its very nature, suggests that there's intentionality, that there's thoughtfulness. Can I just encourage some of us, church, that, that you were designed, you weren't mass produced in a factory. There was thoughtfulness, there was intention. G God designed you with a very specific purpose in mind. In fact, that's what it says. He says, he had designs for us for glorious living. Now, glorious living is not MTV Cribs. It's not rolling in whatever car you want to roll in. No, glorious living is glorious living is defined by how God defines glorious living. So what Paul is saying is that you and I, we were designed for a God purpose. And, and here's what I want to say. This God purpose, look what Paul says, is part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. So in other words, this purpose that God has uniquely instilled and put inside each and every one of us it's actually part of a larger purpose. So remember how a couple weeks ago I talked about you're never going to understand your specific purpose until you understand your universal purpose, your, your general purpose. Here's why. It's because here's what you're, let me, let me just define for you what your specific purpose is. Your specific purpose is simply the specific, unique, personal ways in which you in particular will live out your universal calling and your Christian calling. Does that make sense? That's what your specific purpose is. So that's why it's imperative to understand, well, what is my universal purpose? What is my Christian purpose? Because it's an understanding of that, then you'll actually start to understand and, and discern for yourself, well, what is your, my specific purpose? Because my specific purpose is simply just the unique way and the specific way in which you and I get to live out our universal, universal and general calling and Christian calling in our lives. And so here's what I want us to do, because I think a lot of us, perhaps we haven't fully discovered what that specific purpose is yet. We haven't fully discerned for ourselves, what is that, that thing that God is particularly calling me to? Why is it that I exist on planet earth? What is that unique thing that God has for me? And as a result, I think a lot of us, because we don't necessarily know our specific role and our, our specific purpose, a lot of us, I think, perhaps feel a lot like my five and six-year-olds on my, on my basketball team, where sometimes life just feels a little chaotic. Sometimes it feels a little random. Sometimes it feels a little aimless, and sometimes we feel a little lost and confused as to where we need to be. Because why? Because we don't yet know our role. And so what I want to do for us in just the remaining minutes that we have is 
I, I want to give us uh, some steps or some principles or some suggestions as to how I think you and I might begin to discover and understand and most importantly start to live into our specific purpose and our specific calling. Anybody curious? Anybody want to know what that is? I'm going to give you three steps, all right? Three suggestions, three principles this morning. Uh, again, our, our, our whole kind of point in the sermon series around purpose is we want to get really practical. We want to get really specific. And so uh, we want to help you do that. So write this down. Here's the first one. How do we start to discover our specific God-given role? How do we know our specific purpose that God has for us in this life? Here's number one. Number one is this. If you want to start to discover it, you have to start living into your God-given universal Christian purpose. Now, I know I sound like a broken record by now because I've been saying this over and over and over again, but I so believe this in my heart. Why do we keep going back to understanding? Why do we even start with universal purpose and Christian purpose? Because again, what we need to understand is that they're all interconnected. They're all interrelated. In fact, there's a little diagram here of the little building blocks. Here's why it's so important that we understand it. Our universal purpose and our Christian purpose and our specific purpose, they're all interconnected. So your specific purpose is not detached from your universal purpose. In fact, your specific purpose helps you actually live out your Christian calling and your Christian purpose. Your specific purpose helps you live out your, your universal. So again, if we understand our universal purpose and our Christian purpose, then simply then all we're doing is we're specifically living out those purposes just in a very personal way. One of the, the games that I, I play with my kids uh, sometimes is um, if, if we ever, sometimes we, we, we like go out to dinner uh, or we go to practice and our family's in multiple cars for whatever reason because we come from different places. And so oftentimes I've got like one or two kids in my car and then my wife, my has got the other kids in the other. And uh, one of the games that my kids love to play in the car is called Beat the Other Kids Home. You ever played that, that game growing up? Uh, so they basically want us to like race, you know what I mean? And uh, obviously like we don't break the speed limit, so there's only so much we could do there for our kids. But here's, well, here's what we do, right? That we all know where we're trying to get to. It's just that how many know that there's sometimes different ways to get there? Anybody know about shortcuts? And so this is what we do, even though I can't necessarily speak because I'm a pastor and I got to, you know, I, I got to like be a good example for my kids. So I can't speak. But what I can do is I can look for some shortcuts. And so that's what we'll do. We'll play this game and we'll see who gets home first. But you, typically how it works is we just find different ways or different shortcuts and different side trees so that we get to the place that we're needed to be. Here's what I want to just to convey and to communicate. That's what your specific purpose is. That, that's all it is. So that's why it's so important to understand your universal and your Christian purpose, because all your specific purposes is the specific roads and the specific routes that you're specifically taking. But the end destination is still the same. We're still trying to fulfill and live out our universal purpose, the very purpose that God put us on this planet for. We're still trying to live out our Christian purpose for those of us who call ourselves Christians, the very thing in which Jesus saved us and redeemed us for. How many know that Jesus didn't just save you from something, but he saved you for something? He saved you for purpose and he saved you on purpose. And so this is what I want us to see. That's why it's so important then, if you and I want to start to discover our, our God-given specific purpose, the best thing that you and I could do is just to start to live into the universal purpose and the Christian purpose, which means that you got to know it though, right? Remember I've talked about this, that, that knowing those are the prerequisite to knowing your specific purpose and knowing it isn't just to hear a sermon once or twice and, and to call it good, right? A lot of us, here's the reason why we haven't yet discovered our specific purpose is because we think we know our universal purpose. We think we know our Christian purpose, but we kind of know bits and pieces of it. If you're going to start to identify and understand how God has specifically wired you and how you're called to actually live out your universe and your Christian purpose, you can't just understand and know parts and pieces of it. You've got to understand the full thing. That's why when we talked about the, the universal purpose and the Christian purpose, it's the threefold purpose, right? In fact, do, do I have that slide just as a quick little recap? Not that one. Well, look at that. I don't know what I was trying to do there. All I was trying to illustrate, I was, you can go back to that. That was kind of a bear. I didn't mean to show that one. But... Um, you can go back to that letter one. All I was trying to say, uh, this is my artistic side coming out, is um, the specific ways how you live out the universal Christian purpose. Does that, make, does that, does that work? Um, kind of, sort of. 
So anyways, here's my point though. If, you're, if your understanding of your universal and your Christian purpose is too small and too narrow, then how you think about living out your specific purpose is going to be too small, too narrow. That's why a lot of us are struggling with understanding why God has put us on this earth. Because if you understand your universal purpose as solely just to be in relationship with God, well, then by default, how are you going to live that out specifically? I got to read my Bible and I got to go to church and got to pray three times a day, right? So here's what happens is we don't have a full, robust, holistic understanding of our universal and Christian purpose. You can go to the next slide. And this is what I try to help us understand is that within each of these there's, it's multifaceted, right? And so if all I understand is universal purpose means community with people, that's the only thing I understand about my universal purpose, then all I'm gonna do is just have some fellowship nights and go to youth group. That's all I'm gonna do, right? Because based on what you understand about your universal purpose, that's gonna dictate and define the specific ways that you live it out. That's why it's so important that we have a robust, full, holistic understanding of all of these things. Because when you understand that, then when you actually start to live it out, you start to understand that there are so many different ways for us to live out our Christian calling and our Christian purpose and our universal purpose. That's why a lot of people think that being a Christian and living a good Christian life is just to be a pastor and a missionary. How many of you thought that? Like if for me to serve God, it means I got to go on a mission trip. For me to serve God, it means I got to go on a Bible study on a Bible study. I got to lead a Bible study, right? And, and we have these very specific defined ways of what it looks like to live out our universal and Christian purpose. Why? Because we have too narrow of an understanding of your universal and your Christian purpose. One of the reasons we just started a, a Common Good podcast, and the whole premise of the Common Good podcast is we want to talk to people in our church and around our church, outside of our church, who are simply finding creative and unique ways to live out their faith. Uh, but what we're trying to help people understand is that how you live out your faith, how you live out your universal purpose, how you live out your Christian purpose doesn't always look the same. And what we're trying to do with this podcast, and we interviewed Marky uh, the other month, and she shared about how she's not even sure what her purpose is yet. She's still trying to figure it out. She's still a work in progress, as many of us are. But what she's learned to do is she said, well, I understand some of the basic things around what it means to, to, to live into my universal purpose. I understand that part of what I'm called to do is to co-create with God. So here's one of the ways that I could start to co-create with God is I could start to create a blog and I could start to think about how ethical fashion actually is part of God's way of actually creating things where we're actually caring for the very earth and the planet that we're actually called to live into. And so all of a sudden, when you start to have a bigger, fuller understanding, understanding of your universe and your Christian purpose, all of a sudden it starts to open up the canvas for you to start thinking about how, how has God uniquely wired you? What might you start to do to live into what it is that God has actually uniquely and purposely placed you on this planet for? I love what it says in Ephesians 2.10. It's the verse that comes right after Ephesians 2.8. Through nine, which is the famous verse about it's, it's not by works, it's, it's by faith uh, that you've been saved, what, by faith, through grace, gr by grace, through faith. Um, and right after that, th this is what Paul says. He says, for we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God, listen to this, prepared, aka purposed us for beforehand so that we may, so that we may what? So that we may, we may do them. So it's not enough just to know what our universal purpose is and our Christian purpose, but, but we're called, we're purposed to actually do them. We're called to, to live them out. James 1, through 25 in the message translation, it says this, don't fool yourselves into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but that. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act, act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, and sticks with it, it's no it's, it's, is no distracted scattering, but a man or a woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. So even James talks about this idea that we can't just know things, we, we, we have to do it. And if you and I want to discover a specific purpose, then we need to start living into the things that we already know. 
And it's when we start to live into the things that have already been revealed to us through scripture, through the word, that that's actually when we actually position ourselves to begin to better understand who God has created us to be. That it's in the act of actually doing that we're not like the person who looks in the mirror and forgets who they are, but actually it's the act of doing that we actually discover who we are. That God begins to affirm certain things in our lives that will actually give us insight into what it is that we've been put on this planet for. So uh, one of the, I think the best things that you can start to do is reflect on our, our, your universal purpose and your Christian purpose and those threefold purposes for each. And, and start to ask yourself, this is what I know some of our co-ops have been doing is, what are the purposes that, I, that I'm currently living into? And, and then what are the purposes that I, I'm currently not? What are the purposes that I can actually start to lean into or live into more fully? And my encouragement is as you just start to do that, you don't have to do it perfectly. You just have to do it. You just have to, you just got to do it. But once you start doing it, I promise you that it'll, you'll start to position yourself so that you would actually access and better understand and discover the specific purpose. Let me give you the second one. Second one is this. Be ready to listen and obey when God gives specific instruction. I know it sounds so elementary, but some of us here, the reason why you haven't actualized, you haven't stepped into, you haven't discovered your specific purpose is not because God hasn't told you. It's just because you haven't been listening. You haven't been willing to obey. One of the easiest and most practical ways that we can know our specific role is actually to listen when God speaks to us. And do you realize, I don't know about you, but we believe here that God still speaks. Anybody here believe that? That God didn't just speak 2,000 years ago. He didn't just speak thousands of years ago when when the Bible was written, but but God speaks still through his Holy Spirit. I love what it says in Acts chapter 13 too. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit, somebody say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work, aka the purpose, the role, the task to which I have called them. So we still believe in a God who communicates to his people. We still believe in a God who through his spirit speaks to you and I. We believe in a God who sometimes will give his people specific instructions. In fact, this is what we see all throughout scripture is that this is what God does. That God actually calls specific people for a specific task. Let me just give you a couple examples. Uh, Abraham, uh, Abram, before he turned Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Abram, Abraham became the founding forefather of the nation of Israel. So in large part, It's because he responded to his call. He listened and obeyed to the specific instruction that God gave him. You and I, we're we're reaping the rewards. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, here's the instruction, right? Here's the specific direction. Go out from your country, your relatives and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Then I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that... You will exemplify divine blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but the one who treats you lightly, I must curse so that all the families of the earth may receive blessing through you. That's a big calling. That's some big specific direction. But look at the response in verse four. So Abram left just as the Lord told him to do. And we know the rest is history. Right now, the world is being blessed. You and I are being blessed because this was God's promise to Abram because simply he listened, he heeded, and he obeyed. And now the entire world is being blessed through his very inheritance, through the very people, through the nation of Israel because Abraham listened to God and obeyed. Another is, uh, I was thinking about Mary. You guys know Mary, Virgin Mary? Uh, Look what it says in Luke 1.30. Uh, where an angel comes to Mary, who was just a young teenager. And the angel, uh, a conduit, a messenger of of God speaking, says this in uh, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It says, so the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, here's the instruction. Listen, listen up. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And then let's just skip down for the sake of time to verse 38. Look at Mary's response. Upon listening, upon listening, Mary says, yes, yes, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to your word. Again, are you seeing the pattern? Calling comes. Mary listens, 
she obeys, and, and because of that, we know the rest of the story. That it's through Mary that the very Savior of this world comes into this earth, comes into the world. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, I was thinking about this. He, you, know, you realize because he listened and obeyed the call, he goes from Christian killer to like super Christian missionary and church planter, right? In, in Acts chapter 9, it uh, depicts what happens to, to Saul, Paul, formerly Saul. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That's what he's doing. He was killing Christians. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So as he is en route to go and persecute and uh, imprison more Christians, look what it says in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, a.k.a. this is God now speaking. He falls to the ground and heard a voice Say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The voice says, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He replied, now get up. Here's the instruction. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And we know the rest of the story. Paul does that. He does what he was told what to do. And Paul goes from Christian killer to Christian missionary to church planter to writing two-thirds of the New Testament. My point is this. If you and I want to understand and know the specific call, the specific purpose, the specific instruction that God has for your life, then, then the, the, one of the best things that we could do is actually just start to listen, to start to listen and, and to start to, to obey. See, a lot of us, we haven't experienced, we haven't encountered, we don't understand, we haven't lived into the revelation of what God has given to us, not so much because God hasn't communicated it, but simply because we have, have failed to listen, we have failed to to respond. I remember even when I first, uh, and I've been doing this for a while now, but before pastoring, I was doing other stuff. And I remember in my particular case, I don't think it always happens this way, but in my particular case, the call to become a pastor was very, it was just very specific. But it was so interesting to me because even as specific and as clear cut as it was, like, I don't know if I'm just hard headed or what, but in my mind, I'm like, I don't know, God, are you really saying this? And like, I'll tell you the longer story some other time, but there were some very specific things that God was saying to me. I remember this one time where it was so specific after a period of like four to six months, I'm like in my discernment process, right? After God literally has been like knocking me upside the head, telling me this is what I'm supposed to do. And I remember sitting down with one of my mentors at the time. And I was like, hey, so I need you to help me like discern this because I can't figure out if this is God or not. And I literally told him what had happened to me over the course of the, the last three to four to five months. And he looks at me like confused and annoyed. And he's like, dude, it's obvious what God is saying to you. And I remember that moment. I was like, you're right. You're right. It's, it's pretty obvious, right? But for whatever reason, as obvious as it was, I refused to listen and I refused to obey. Can, can I encourage a church? I don't know what God might be saying to you in this season. Maybe there's some specific instructions. Maybe there's some specific direction. Maybe there's a particular task that God is speaking to you about right now. Can I encourage you? Don't miss out on whatever God wants to do in and through you because you're too busy to listen and because you're too hard-headed to obey. We got to learn to listen to obey. Let, let me give you the last one. Last one is this. If you want to understand your God-given purpose, your, your, your specific God-given purpose, your specific role, uh, one of the most important, and I'm going to end here, it's this. We have to learn to see the clues and use the tools you've already been given. If you don't get any other point, get this one. If you want to start to learn and discover your specific God-given purpose, you, we need to learn to see the clues and use the tools you've already been given given. Do you realize there's, there's levels to specificity? I think sometimes we get frustrated in the Christian life because we're like, God, give me some specifics. Sometimes, let me say this, because this was my previous point. Sometimes God gives us specific instructions by specifically speaking to you and giving you specifically what you need to do. I believe that. It's happened to me, and I think it's happened to some of you, that there are moments and seasons and times where God will give you and I specific instruction. But how many know that just because God doesn't specifically tell you what to do, it does not mean that God's not being specific with us. In fact, if you look at scripture, while there are a lot of cases in which God gives the very specific direct instructions, there are plenty of cases and situations and scenarios in scripture where God doesn't give a whole lot of details. In fact, just think about the, the, the disciples for one. You remember how Jesus calls the disciples? He goes up to these fishermen and he's like, hey, 
follow me. How many of you would like, just go follow this random dude that just came up to you out of nowhere and just said, follow me, right? They're probably thinking, follow you? Who are you? Like, uh, and where are we going? And for how long? And what, what are you going to pay me? And what are we supposed to do? Like, there wasn't a lot of detail. But yet what? They, they still... They, they still follow. See, a lot of us, I think we get frustrated because we're looking for these very specific details. When can I suggest that oftentimes the way that God communicates his specific plans and purposes for your life is not through an audible voice. It's not through him telling you this one specific thing. See, a lot of us, I think, are frustrated. We become frustrated in the Christian life because we think there's this one thing that I was created to do. There's this one person I was, I'm supposed to marry. And I'm still like, I'm 40 still trying to find that one person. Like a lot of us, this is what we think. This is what we, we have been conditioned growing up in, the, for, perhaps for some of us growing up in the church, this is what we've been told, that there's this one thing that God has purposed you for. Now, can I just maybe encourage some of us and release some of us to breathe a little bit? That might be true, but for the majority of us, that's, that's probably not true. That while God will give specific, clear directions at times, just because in Scripture we see that there's been some moments and situations and occasions in which he does it does not mean that it's normative. Just because we've seen people that it happens to doesn't mean that it's prescriptive. How many know there's a difference when we read Scripture? We have to understand whether something's descriptive or prescriptive. That's oftentimes why we misinterpret a lot of things in Scripture, because we see things in Scripture, and because it describes what happens, we assume that that's for everybody. But do you realize that that's not for everybody? In fact, here's one of the most powerful, profound ways that God speaks to you and I. It's actually through what he's already put inside of you. In fact, I wrote this down. Uh, I think we have it up on the screen. Look, write this down. Understanding God's specific purpose. This is going to help some of you. Understanding God's specific purpose is less about waiting to hear a specific instruction from God as it is to see the specific clues signs, and tools that God has already infused into your very being. This is crucial. You want to start to understand and discover your, your God-given specific purpose. Understanding a specific purpose is less about hearing a specific instruction, a specific direction, a specific thing that you're supposed to do, as it is to learn to see the specific clues, signs, and tools that God has already infused into your very being. I love what it says in Psalm 139.13. In the message translation, it says this. Oh, yes, you have shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. This is the psalmist talking to God. I thank you, high God, your breathtaking body. Oh, I am marvelous, marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know my every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watch me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared, purposed, before I'd even live one day. Here's my point. Worship team, you can come on this one. This, I'm done. Your specific God-given purpose, you don't have to go searching for it. You don't have to go looking for it. In fact, you don't even have to wait for it. It's, it's already inside of you. It's already imprinted in your very DNA. It, 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 it's already right there in the very thing that God had created you from the very beginning. Uh, how, how do you know it then? If it's already in us, I, I just want to, as we end, I want to give you three practical things you could think about. If it's true then that you actually don't have to go looking for it, you don't have to go searching for it, you don't have to ask God for it, but it's already inside of you, it's already embedded in who you are, how do you start to cultivate it? How do you start to see it? How do you start to identify it? How do you start to use it? I'm going to give you the, the tools right now. You want to know what the, the, the clues and the tools are? Number one is this, circumstances. Circumstances. And another, another way to put it is this is what some people call your providential call. Circumstances are really things that are outside of your control, right? These are things that happen to you, but oftentimes apart from you. And I want to su suggest that a lot of us, we don't like our circumstances, or we compare our circumstances to other people's circumstances. We, we, we compare the, 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 the hand that we've been dealt in life. We're like, why, 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 why did I get this? 
Can I encourage you, instead of comparing, instead of complaining about the hand that you've been dealt, to actually recognize that the circumstances that you've been given are actually the very gift that God has given to you to actually live out your specific purpose and calling. So the key is we got to start to ask ourselves, what are my circumstances? So you can look at your past history. You, you can look at your family of origin. You can look at the family that you're raised in. You can look at the, your ethnicity, your race, the language that you speak, what gender. You, you can look at the characteristics of, of who you are. See, all these things are clues as to who it is that God has created you to be so that you could fulfill a specific purpose. The circumstances aren't just about your, your past and history, but I would suggest that circumstances are, can, can also pertain to like today, your current situation and season, the amount of money that you have in your bank account, the type of job that you possess, your current age and life stage, your health. See, a lot of these things, we, we don't like them, but, but instead of, of actually complaining about, I wonder if God is inviting us to say, the specific circumstances and situations that I find myself in might actually be the very clues to what it is that God wants me to do with my life right now today. That they're the specific tools that you have been given to fulfill a very specific God-given purpose. Circumstances is the one tool. Here's the second tool that you've been given, already embedded in who you are. It's your talents. Another way to, 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 to consider it, another way that people talk about it, it's, 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 it's the, the charismatic call. Charismatic not in the sense of charismatic churches, charisma in a sense of it's a gift from God. You realize that your talents, your skills, it's a gift from God. And, and those talents and those skills, they're not just meant for you. They're not just for your benefit. They're not just for you to find out how you can best monetize your skills and your talents. But do you realize that the skills and the talents that have been put into you are actually put there for a purpose to actually glorify God and to work for the benefit of others. I love what it says right here. Let me just read you this verse. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, different kinds of talents, different kinds of skills, but of the same spirit that distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work who dis distributes them, who deposits them. Now listen to this, verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, all these gifts, all these talents, all these skills, they've been given for the common good. For the common good. In other words, these are tools that God has given to you specifically to use to fulfill your universe and your Christian purpose. The question is, what are you doing with your talents? What do you use them for? To what end do they serve? Let me give you the third, the third tool in your little toolbox. You gotta look at your, your, your circumstances, you gotta look at your, your talents, but the third one is passions. It's also called the heart call. I know oftentimes when we talk about passions, passions sometimes have so many different meanings and sometimes I think we get passions confused with pleasure. But do you realize that the definition of passion is this? It's a strong and barely controllable emotion. A strong, a barely controllable emotion. Another definition of it, passion, it's the suffering and death of Jesus. Realize that passion is actually about suffering. Passion is about what is so deep down in the core of who you are that you're actually willing to die for. See, a lot of us, we think passions is, is, is doing the thing that, that just makes me happy. My passions are the thing that, that it makes me feel good. It gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. But if you're to really leverage the tool that God has given to you, which is called your passion, which is your heart call, it's actually to dig a little bit deeper and to say, what is that one thing in your life? What is that one thing at the deep core of your heart that if you're like, I don't do this, if I don't do this, I'm actually neglecting a part of who I am. That it's, it, it's so deeply embedded in your spirit that you're like, I have to do this. I have to do this. Can I encourage you, church? Don't wait for God to give you a specific direct call. You don't have to wait because already embedded in your spirit he's given you some circumstances he's given you some talents and he's he's given you a passion and if you start to to just to understand those and i guarantee you church you, you'll start to live into your specific god-given purpose i love this illustration i and hear the, the story that i heard long ago this is author he wrote a book and and he says you know what, how to live into your specific God-given purpose and your specific God-given calling? He says it's kind of like this. 
It's like, here's kind of what God has given to you. He, he's given you a blank canvas. And for some of us, he's given us an 8 by 10. Some of us, he's given us an 11 by 17. Others of us, he's given a, a, a canvas the size. It, it doesn't matter, but he's given us all a canvas. And it's a blank canvas. And then what he's done is he's given you some tools. He's given you some paint brushes. And he's given you some colors. And the paint brushes have different sizes and different lengths and, 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 and different firmness and different shapes. And, and then he's given us different colors. And, and here's what God is saying. If you want to start to live into your specific God-given purpose, he's saying, just take the canvas that I've been given you and take the tools that I've entrusted to you and just go and start to paint something beautiful. Start to paint something beautiful. I don't know what it is that you're searching for, but I guarantee you that if you can just start doing that, come on, I believe that you're going to start to see and experience and, and actualize the specific things that God has put deep down in the side of you, that you'll start to experience a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and joy that comes from actually living in to the specific thing that God has put you on this planet for that nobody else in this world can do other than you. Let me pray for you, Father God. We thank you, God, that you are a God of intention. You are a God of purpose. And you have instilled and put inside every single one of us a unique, specific, personal, God-given purpose. So God, I pray that you would help us. Help us now to, to not let that sit by the wayside, but that we would actually do the work to call that out, to discover it, to identify, and to realize and to recognize that, that the very thing that sometimes we are waiting for you to give us, you've actually instilled in us. So help us, God, to recognize the specific circumstances and the talents and the passions that you have given to us. These are all clues. They're all signs. They're all tools to be taken up and to be used so that we might start to live into the specific God-given purpose and destiny and calling that you have purposed for us, God. We love you for it. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.